Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be with you today, and, and very humbled because I think when you talk to uh, the folks on the front lines, as Reggie said, this is not an easy task, but it really is our task. And I, I just wanted to start out by reflecting a moment on our opportunities as pediatricians to meet the families early, sometimes even before the birth of the first or the next child, to have a longitudinal relationship with our families and children, to be in a space that I think is very precious. It's one of the few spaces and places that we have when we have that patient encounter, that we have family members and children together focusing on the health of that child. And I think it's a very privileged place. And when you think of that, there are very few other places for families and children to come together and focus on that child. So I think that we, uh, as we approach this work, I think we should just uh, spend a moment and think how privileged we are to be in that space. What a wonderful gift uh, for us to be able to interact with our families and children and to see the work as a, a work in progress. So many of you may be far along in this work. Some of you may be just starting this work and it is a work in progress. And uh, just like we ask our patients to take one small step at a time, you don't have to swallow this work whole. You can take one step at a time as you begin to move the work into your practice and um, realize the, the incredible importance you have to the patients and families you serve. So the learning objectives for today are really to, to ground us all in what we, most of us know, but to just ground us back to the expert recommendations on obesity as they apply to prevention and treatment in primary care and talk a little bit about uh, the uh, tertiary care. Apply these recommendations to clinical practice and just get you thinking about how, how that's going. And um, a little bit about obesity-related comorbidities. So not an, this is not an unusual case. An eight-year-old boy comes to your office after an absence of a couple of years, and mom says he's gained 30 pounds since you last saw him. So now where are you going with that? Well, the expert recommendations on ob obesity really tried to frame our work in terms of assessment. What things would we need to assess? Certainly, we need to measure height and weight and assess BMI and classify BMI, but we need to do other kinds of assessments. What's the nutritional pattern? What are the activity patterns? What might be the readiness to change? Where are we going to? This is the art of medicine. Where are you going to help that family make change? And uh, what are the high-risk behaviors? So obesity can be seen in light of a high BMI and obesity prevention, uh, preventing a high BMI, but it can also be seen in light of preventing high-risk behavior, just like maybe we did with the AIDS epidemic. What are the high-risk behaviors that are appearing even before uh, the BMI gets high, and, who, and how, can we, uh, how can we deal with that? How can we use evidence-based and an expert-informed um, data to really look at those behaviors and what behaviors should we target? Uh, how can we use a stepwise approach to prevention and treatment? And there's something very interesting about prevention. It's sometimes very hard to get your arms around the, the value of it. We all appreciate the value. But one thing that has become very clear to me is prevention is cumulative. It takes cumulative messages. It takes multi-sector messages. It takes community-based and practice-based messages. And we do have the chance to both have cumulative messages as we see our children along the lifespan and the multi-sectoral messages because we reach out into the community. Um, this, these guidelines addressed obesity along the continuum because while uh, 25 years ago when I started the obesity clinic at AI DuPont, I might have had, had uh, I not been laughed at, and that is the truth, it was just in nobody's radar screen. If we had done massive prevention efforts then, it might have been all about prevention. But right now, we have to handle prevention, early intervention, and treatment of obese children, and we, we are working along that whole continuum every day. Um, we know we work with our multidisciplinary partners, which have expanded in our thinking about obesity beyond sort of our specialists, it, to our dietitians, to our psychologists, now to our community partners. And so we view the, the, the sort of team now as the community team. At least that's what I think we're being called to do when we, dis, when we think about obesity. And certainly view the families as our partners. 
And uh, you'll learn later in this conference about how you view the family as a partner, how you really um, bring help and assistance and share thinking with the mom, the dad, the grandparent, the family, the child about how to approach this problem, really in a partnership mode. So again, we have many things to assess. And you can approach this in a stepwise fashion. So uh, when we ran our obesity collaborative with 20 of our practices in Delaware, we spent uh, the first part of it just saying, how are we going to um, accurately measure height and weight and assess and classify BMI? Who's going to do it in the office? How will that work? How will that information get to the chart? Then we went on to how we, we, will we assess diet and activity and, and then readiness to change? And then what will the health message B. So you can approach it in a stepwise fashion if you're trying to change, as you try to change your practice workflow, because many of these, these things involve both information and practice workflow changes you have to make. So you know that, in the, that now we're very familiar, but uh, we used to call uh, the BMI between 85th and 94th percentile at risk uh, for obesity. Now it's overweight obesity, and we're all struggling with what does severe obesity how to categorize that, what does that mean? Because we know there's a great deal of difference whether you're a quarter of an inch above the 95th percentile or five inches above the 95th percentile. How do we deal with that? And many people are using uh, BMI standard deviation scores or Z-scores or 100%, 20% over the 95th percentile, struggling with what that high morbidity means. So the stepwise approach is somewhat based on location. We talked about what could be done in primary care somewhat based on BMI, what happens when you can't get traction on the BMI and you move through these stages and response to treatment. So prevention and prevention plus and so in some sense of structured weight management were all thought to have uh, pr large primary care components. By the time you got to comprehensive multidisciplinary interventions where you had a team or the tertiary care interventions where you were uh, doing surgery and you had you know, intense interventions, those last two were seen to be really obesity programs at hospitals. So the stepwise prevention and treatment, the evidence base is pretty constant. We, and we'll review just some of, the, some of the evidence base for the messages, but the intensity of the intervention changes. So as your children get sicker, you're in, you want increasing contact, increasing family self uh, involvement, increasing self monitoring, and increasing multidisciplinary support. So this is one of those fields where the content uh, really is rolled into an increasingly intense approach as the child gets sicker, more obese, with more, more comorbidities. So when we look at the expert recommendations, we knew at the time that there were there were going to be recommendations where we had consistent evidence. And so these are the recommendations here that showed uh, that these were effective uh, at either uh, reducing obesity risk or altering energy balance. And they are uh, limiting consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages, limiting TV exposure, removing TV from the primary sleeping area, daily breakfast, limit eating out, encouraging family meals, and limiting portion sizes. And this is a pretty nice menu, actually, to work with, because it, it are, there are uh, most families will either identify one of these areas or, or you'll work with them to, to focus on one of these areas that you can uh, work on. There was uh, another category of recommendations in those guidelines that said the evidence suggests that these may be helpful. So the studies didn't, uh, really didn't look at weight or energy balance or they were too few or too small, but the expert committee thinks that these things would support a healthy lifestyle and would not be harmful. So uh, calcium and fiber in the diet, a balanced macronutrient um, diet. Um, breastfeeding is starred because all, uh, the, the expert committee did not call out breastfeeding to the extent that the CDC and many of the rest of us have as a primary obesity prevention strategy. Um, promoting moderate to vigorous activity and limiting consumption of energy dense foods. Still a good repertoire when you're driving toward health. And so many of us now, the BMI is very important to measure and classify, but people always respond better to a positive message. You can scare them for a very limited time that goes away. You can't leave in crisis mode when you have a chronic problem. So what are we offering to our parents? How to get healthier? How these things support overall health in, in, in multiple dimensions. So the prevention strategy really said, at every well visit, at every opportunity, do these basic um, operationalize these strategies. And so 
I remember, and Charlie may remember this, years ago when we were up in Massachusetts and we were, you were thinking about 5210 and thinking, well, what kind of message is this? It seems limited. We're clinicians after all and we have to look at the whole patient. That we kind of came up with the thought that these are gateway messages, right? So you start with fruits and vegetables and it opens the door to you to think about dietary change, right? You talk about two or a few hours of screen time and it opens the door into looking at the child's quality of life. Is the only thing they have in their life screen time? Are they doing anything else with their time? Maybe they don't know what to do. The parent doesn't know what to do. Maybe the environment needs to change. Um, one or more hours of daily physical activity opens the door into is the child capable of physical activity at, at the very baseline? You know, are they having knee pain? Are they having hip pain? Are they sleeping well? Are they too tired? To what are the resources in the home and the community? And what kind of physical activity might we do? And, and is it exercise or just activities of daily living? But you opened that door. And no sugar sweetened beverages, to me, are both a strategy, a very important one, and sort of an open door into high risk behavior. Like, what are the high risk behaviors for a disease? So you can use this as a prevention message, but you can also use it to open the door to, to what's behind it and to do the counseling. So I wanted to just spend a minute or two on just the evidence that we do have about these strategies. So energy density and the diet is positively associated with body weight. We kind of get know that a lot of this uh, is obvious, but there are studies that you can use to support why you're doing this. Um, obese children had a higher energy density diet than lean children. Um, Obviously, where do you get energy density in your diet? You get it usually from snack foods and added sugars and fat. That's how you get it. It's very hard. I think I've only had one child in 25 years that was gaining weight on a completely healthy diet, and she was two, and was being served adult-sized portions of very healthy food. That is very rare. You, it's, it's hard to gain a lot of weight when you have an extremely healthy diet. Um, you just can't eat enough. Uh, interventions that lower dietary energy density by increasing fruits and vegetables and decreasing fat are an effective strategy and, and also promote health. And so what we're finding, too, is that families have drifted away from the idea that, that healthy food actually promotes actual health in your body. Like there's a concept that if I eat this, my body will work better. It's not just calories. It's my body will actually function better. I will feel better. And for uh, families, that it's real hard to take the long view. If you really do a conversion, which sometimes you can do from a, uh, sort of that junk food diet to a very healthy diet, people feel better. And they feel better in days. They feel better in a matter of days. So um, the health value of food seems to be something that families have sort of drifted away from, probably because it's the health value of food the, the palatability of food and the taste of food and the fun of food and the reward of food have been marketed, um, and, and that's what's in their brains. Um, fiber content is likely one of the main mechanisms through which um, uh, the satiety effect of that may be a mechanism that uh, reduces obesity, and we know that this has a positive effect on uh, cardiovascular risk factors and lipids. So um, families sometimes respond to these positive messages uh, around weight and above and beyond weight. Um, you, youth that had uh, DASH diets and did well with them had lower BMI Z scores. And um, this is type 1 diabetes, but there was an association of, uh, with a DASH diet with a lower hemoglobin A1C. And since we'll, uh, we, we are now focused on type 2 diabetes and lowering hemoglobin A1Cs, I think this is important. Um, and blood pressure. So there are many reasons. Um, beyond and above and, and weaving weight through total health to look at this message. Um, uh, smaller gains in BMI. So if you have an already obese kid, we still can get traction. And um, total fruit intake and lower dairy intake in some studies were the food groups that, that were uh, found to be effective. And uh, whole grains. So not things that you already know, but there is some evidence here to show that we're on the right track. So, when we talk about television, you realize that food is the most commonly advertised um, product on children's television. And we know that most children begin watching television before age two. And by the time they're five, they've seen an average of more than 4,000 television commercials for food annually. Okay? And what is advertised on that are usually sugared cereals and fast food. And so during Saturday morning cartoons, children see one food ad every five minutes. 
and they're for poor nutritional food. So we are, you know, we're bringing into the home um, a very powerful marketing tool to very susceptible population. And I think that that goes without saying. And I think parents, we, we sort of, parents may not be aware of this because we kind of blank out this aspect of TV. We're watching the programming and, and the, the commercials are just coming in and uh, people aren't thinking about it. Um, there was a recent study that really looked at commercial viewing with the commercials in place. Um, was significantly associated with a higher BMI score at young, younger children, but non-commercial viewing had no significant association. So if you can't get people to reduce the total screen time or you're working hard on that, you can at least talk to them about commercials and reducing commercial TV time as a, a, an initial strategy while you're working on total screen time, which involves a lot of helping them discuss what are the options, what could we do if we're not watching television, what could we do, and many families need some practice thinking about that. We know physical activity, and Reggie alluded to this, is so, is so important, both for weight, fitness, and, um, and I, again, I'll say it, overall good health and reduction of comorbidities. So physical activity is very powerful. And in the diabetes trials of lifestyle intervention, lifestyle with a diet and physical activity was as powerful as a medication. And when you tell parents, this is, this is the medicine for your child. This is what's going to, you need a daily dose of this. It's like taking a medicine. Very, very powerful. Um, and we know the barriers. Uh, and, and this is an opportunity to look at barriers. Sometimes children are so inactive that we just work with activities of daily living. We just try to increase distance walked from the school bus. We, we try to look at uh, chores around the house. We try to look at anything we can to get the kids up and moving. Uh, if, that's all you, is that, if that's what you have to work with, that's what you work with, and then sugared beverages. So you'll hear David Ludwig talk later about this, and I won't belabor it, but we know that fructose um, is really different than glucose. Um, it favors lipogenesis, making fat cells. It doesn't stimulate insulin or leptin production, which are satiety factors in their own right. And you get different signaling when you eat fructose. So this is not just to know that fructose metabolism is complex, but very different than glucose metabolism. And we know that as total uh, high fructose corn syrup in the triangles there um, became uh, paralleled the obesity epidemic. And so uh, is it the only actor? No, but it's an important one. And I think um, we really know that these small calorie differences, like 132 kilocalories a day, can, can result in a significant weight gain. Um, so the, this, is a, this is very important. And um, we know that it was introduced as a cost-cutting measure because it was cheaper than sucrose to use in these drinks. So people, uh, families often are, um, this can be emotional for families. Um, it's not always that easy to ask them to give up these drinks. Um, they can reduce them. You can do this incrementally. But this surely is a prime target for us. Um, and the quantity of sugar-sweetened beverages ingested predicted rises in body mass index for kids. So it also in the expert report, we considered that all children were considered at risk for obesity. And Reggie um, was asked to be positive and didn't call this out on the Trust for America's Children, but the obesity rates are still uh, expected to continue at an, uh, at an alarming rate, and especially in high-risk populations. And um, so prevention is prevention and should be applied to all. The messages at well visits should be simple, consistent, and cumulative, and, and, and you can use these messages as gateways. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to take a lot of time, but it's the repetition. It's the repetition. So prevention, what do we do? When we have a child at a normal BMI, we look, these are some things you can look at. Are they eating age-appropriate portions? So um, you know, if you ask the average parent what's the uh, vegetable serving for a two-year-old, very few of them know what that is. And what's the vegetable serving for a nine-month-old? So parents have, have sort of got portion distortion. And um, it's very obvious when they explain to you that the child is eating you know, two-thirds of an adult portion and they're two years old. Um, parents provide and child decides is something Bill Dietz talks about, that what's the job of the parent? Put good nutritional meals on the table. What's the job of the child? To eat whatever they want of that good nutritional meal. So children can decide, am I hungry enough for that meal or not? 
but they shouldn't be like the, the mother who told me proudly that her two-year-old was able to operate the microwave and heat up a snack. You know, they shouldn't, like parents tell me the five-year-old, yeah, he just goes, opens the refrigerator, goes in, gets what he wants. I mean, this is clearly um, not the boundaries you would like in, in parenting behavior. So much of this revolves around helping parents reset boundaries and learn how to parent around these behaviors. Or like the mother of a 13 and 14-year-old siblings, when we were discussing dinner, I happened to ask, um, who decides what to cook for dinner at your house? And she said, they do. I said, what do you mean they do? Well, I said, how do you work that out? You have two kids. She said, well, we alternate days. One day the 13-year-old decides, the next day the 14-year-old decides. I said, you don't decide anything about what cooks? No, I just get their order and go out and buy the food. So, you know, you, you do need to sort of ask what, what's happening there, who's deciding what to eat. And mo many, many times the children are deciding and making the bulk of those decisions. Um, structure, you all know that the structure, when families are stressed, structure breaks down. Structured meals break down, eating becomes more like grazing, physical activity goes by the wayside if it's not incidental to living your life. And so structure, tends to just seep out. And so many times you're, you're helping families sort of recreate a structure in this, the home setting that can allow three meals and a snack for an older kid and family dinners and no TV while eating and reduction of fast food. And then trying to help them balance the food group intake with the kid who never eats anything that isn't, what, isn't white. You know, so they have the white diet. And this can happen in the schools. I had a kid from uh, our southern part of our state uh, describe a lunch to me that was yogurt, french fries, and um, bread and milk. And I thought, well, that's, you know, completely white. So uh, just trying to figure out how to help them with food groups. Um, monthly follow-up, and I know this sounds like a lot, um, but when you get to overweight status, people's behavioral change if you've ever tried to make any behavioral change yourself, it extinguishes, it takes reinforcement. And so when you get into the overweight and obese categories, you need to see these kids or connect with these kids on a frequent basis. You need to structure in Prevention Plus a little bit more and have them commit or have them think about family meals because we're uh, a little more frequently on a regular basis. Um, look at, re -go, go over parenting behavior again and then plan for activity, plan, more planning. And planning is really time management, and time management is a skill that a lot of families struggle with. How to manage my time so I can get done what I have to do, how to do the things I think are important, because I, in a stressed family, families react to what's immediate, not necessarily what's important, so time management is important. Self-monitoring by the provider, the patient, or the family is really important. And you know, you could say, well, you know, Sandy, the patients, when they bring diet records in, um, why is that important? Because I don't know if I really trust what they're going to say. So my take on diet records is diet, our patients are no different than us. How many of you going to the doctor when asked, have you stopped this? Have you done that? Have you gone to the gym? Report on your best efforts. <laughs> yeah, I'm going three days a week. Well, yeah, once a month you went three days a week, but the rest of the time you went one day a week, but I'm going to tell you my best. So I think it's not, it's just, they're, they're reporting on their best behavior, but there is good evidence that self-monitoring helps behavior change and helps stay on target. And I think you, if you take it like that, then you're less concerned with, you know, just the fact that they're watching what they're doing is very important. Group visits may be important here in structured weight management. The problem with current group visits is it's a hard reimbursement model. It, we don't have a reimbursement model that fits that, but there are ways to achieve that. By the time you get to complementary multidisciplinary intervention, this is actually where the evidence is good, that, that multidisciplinary teams can be effective in, in uh, obesity treatment, but it's a, it's a labor-intensive uh, activity. The eating and activity goals are the same, but the intensity ramps up um, considerably, and uh, you're using every member of your team. Um, and you're using behavior modification techniques and enhancing your motivational interviewing techniques and often you're relying on your psychologist to get this work done. And believe me, when you see a 475 pound 15 year old walk in your office and you ask them what they're worried about and weight doesn't come up in the conversation, you know, we have a long road to go with these kids. But it doesn't mean we don't do it. So my bias here is 
Um, these are sick children with a chronic disease. If an asthmatic came to you and said, oh, you know, I just don't feel like using my inhaler this month. I just feel like, you know, I'm not really motivated to do that. You would not just say, oh, fine, come back when you're motivated to, no, you would work on that. You would figure out what's happening, why they're not, how you can help them. Same with an obese kid because these are sick children. And the longer it goes, the worse it gets. And then tertiary care is where I live a lot of my life, and so we have um, bariatric surgery, and we have intense psychological support, and we have groups. Um, we have taught do cooking classes. We're trying everything we can to get traction with the sickest kids. So our eight-year-old boy came in. This was really what he, his growth chart looked like, weight, height, and BMI. So you know you're pretty far. He has a you know, pretty far. That's the four inch above the 95th percentile curve. And we know the kids that have these high BMIs um, have a greater rate of cardiovascular risk factors. And not only that, children with a BMI over the 99th percentile, when followed into adulthood, are likely to be at, if they have this at age 12, they're likely to be an obese adult. 100% of these kids had BMIs over 30, which is adult obesity. 90% had a BMI over 35. And 65% would have qualified for bariatric surgery with an adult surgeon. So by 12, if this is your picture, unless you are really intensely active, we are in trouble already. So what do we do with this kid? We, this is our dietary assessment. These are the things we're interested in. And this was his dietary pattern. He had breakfast at home, not bad. Cereal with 2% milk. But he had breakfast at school. Surprise to mom, right? Are you eating breakfast? Both of them are nodding their heads. Where are you eating breakfast? Mom says home, he says school. So we knew extra meals are, are not unusual. School, they were giving them extra money. I don't know if you have it, but we have these credit card things. Parents put money on every month. The kid swipes the credit card, and the parent goes, I, I wondered why he was running out of money you know, for the school. Well, buy an extra snacks. Uh, snack, after school snack, which is not untypical, um, dinner out, seconds at home, and then drinking five glasses of some sugar-sweetened beverage a day. So this was his pattern, and it's not uh, far-fetched to think how he got to that BMI. So then you go ahead and you assess his physical activity, and he has phys ed once a week, um, and that's not bad. He is recessed daily, but when you ask him, what do you do, he stands around. So recess is not a surrogate for physical activity unless you kind of know what's happening. There is no after school outdoor time in his life. And outdoor time turns out to be a big um, uh, surrogate marker for physical activity. And then a lot of screen time and a TV in his bedroom. You move on to the family history, and you know now that you're honing down into the, the, the comorbidities here with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Um, and uh, it may be the touch point for change for many families because uh, he had a father with hypertension and obesity and sleep apnea and a maternal grandmother with diabetes. And this may be the point of activation for most families who do not want the child to repeat that history. And mo most obese parents that I've ever met do not want that child to repeat their history. They often have a very difficult uh, history with their own weight. It's a sad history. They struggle. They feel guilty. They don't want the kid to repeat that. So what your job is to create enough of a, of an a, of a facilitating atmosphere in the encounter where you can then um, get past often the self-blame and the guilt that the parents have about this kid to a place where you can have a conversation about how to move forward. So maybe five years or seven years ago, I didn't have to talk about severe obesity-related emergencies, but there are some. So hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state is a way that kids present with uh, diabetes. They present uh, with um, osmolalities in the thousands. Um, the first eight cases of this, when reported, had, uh, were at, uh, teenagers who came into ERs in comas as their first presentation for uh, diabetes, and they died. So what happened the two weeks prior to that? They were complaining to their primary care physicians of fatigue, nausea, weakness. An obese kid who's sick needs a blood sugar. I'm sorry, they do, unless you really can say this is not their onset. Fatigue, nausea, headache, weakness. This could be a presentation. And although it's rare, this isn't that easy to handle when you get it in, in the emergency room. Type 2 diabetics also present in classic DKA. We've had kids um, have pulmonary emboli, um, some after orthopedic surgery, some who have had high risk factors in their family. And we have had kids with cardiomy classic cardiomyopathy and large hearts from obesity. So uh, 
the other thing that should be added to this list are all the emergencies that can occur for, with adolescents that have had bariatric surgery. So you kind of need to know if you have adolescents, if they've had bariatric surgery, you just kind of need to be alerted for that. These are comorbidities that require immediate attention. So pseudotumor cerebri, if they have um, optic, you lose your, your disc margin, you have papilledema, you can present with headache. Um, sometimes you find this incidentally. So the last adolescent we had was an adolescent boy, hurt his leg, came to the ER. The resident was complete, looked in his eyes. He had papilledema. He was already losing his visual field. So you go blind if this isn't treated. Um, that if you rule out all other causes of CNS pathology, um, that their opening pressures are high, you treat them with diamox, sometimes they need epidural shunts, but it's not a trivial problem to have and you just need to be aware of it. Um, we all know about subcapital femoral epiphysis and Blount's disease, particular uh, obesity related uh, conditions to children. Uh, the, the mean time to diagnosis of a SCIFI uh, is, is still in the months because these kids have awkward gaits, they often limp, if you're not alert to doing a good hip exam in a child that, that is, has any joint complaint, and in every child you should be examining their hips, you can kind of miss it, you pin these hips the same day. And you often pin the, the contralateral hip because there's a bilateral incidence of 20%. Sleep apnea, common, common, common. So you get a kid who's not performing well in school, okay? It's not because he's lazy or lack of motivation. Your differential includes all the things that you would think of, depression, ADHD, which is underdiagnosed in this group, and sleep apnea. Um, asthma has a high comorbid incidence with obesity, and uh, poorly treated asthma, they won't be exercising. Um, obesity worsens their exercise capability and sometimes their asthma, and you can get in a vicious cycle if you don't have a good asthma plan along with your obesity plan. So this is your chance to do two diseases at once. Whenever you see an obese asthmatic, a kid with obesity and asthma, you should be talking about both, no matter if they're seeing you for obesity or they're seeing you for asthma. Liver disease is sort of the stealth disease here. It's very alarming. 20% um, of many, many kids have fat in their liver, in their pancreas, in their muscles when they get obese. But 20% um, uh, have elevated liver enzymes, and many of those kids already are showing fibrotic changes in their liver. If you happen to biopsy these, there's no known treatment for this except weight reduction. And there are young adults that come to liver transplantation based solely on non-alcoholic hepatosteatosis. So it, it, it is um, alarming, and we don't have a good answer yet. And then gallbladder disease is just the same as everybody else. These are the chronic obesity-related comorbid conditions. We'll be talking about some of these later. Um, these, this is the, 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 the everyday of obesity management. And I will say prevention of type 2 diabetes is taking a very high priority because we know a few things. And one of the things we know is a child with impaired glucose tolerance is only taking two to three years to develop type 2 diabetes. They're moving much faster, we think, along that trajectory toward diabetes. And once you get type 2 and your beta cells have sort of given out, this is a very ugly disease to manage. It's hard for the patient. It has a high morbidity. There's end organ failure in, in about 20 years. And our youngest type 2 diabetic is six years old. So I just, uh, you know, we could talk a long time. Psychological morbidities, and I think Reggie will be talking about this at length. There's a lot of depression, low self-esteem, anxiety in this population. We get maybe two to three kids who are suicidal that walk into obesity clinic, un previously undiagnosed as having suicidal ideation, um, because we, we ask and we, we look for the depression. So our little eight-year-old boy had snoring, uh, daytime tiredness, um, possible sleep apnea. The gold standard for diagnosis of this is really nighttime polysomnography. You, it, you just don't know until you test. And then um, he had poor school performance, and it could be the sleep apnea. It could be a little ADD. It could be his, he was being teased in his low self-esteem. Blood pressure, you know, a little bit high, prehypertension. He had acanthosis. Um, he had enlarged tonsils, and in this age group, there's an overlap between large tonsils and the effect of obesity on, upper air, on the upper airway. Laboratory evaluation, and we may get questions, but these are the recommendations. If they're overweight, fasting lipid profile, liver enzymes every two years. If they're obese, lipid profile, liver enzymes, fasting glucose uh, every uh, two years. And as always, this depends on your clinical judgment. We can talk about this at length. So his LFTs were normal, his cholesterol triglycerides were somewhat high, his HDL somewhat low, fasting glucose was okay, but you know, you always like to see it lower. Hemoglobin A1C 
was a little high, and as fasting insulin was 32. We do insulins for the purposes of our studies. It's not in the recommendations, but gives you an indication. So we have a sick little boy on our hands, and we now have who, what is our, who's, who's the clinical team? Well, I'm part of the clinical team, but the family is really your clinical team. The family is part of your clinical team. If there's going to be intervention, they're going to do it. So they're, they're critical to this. So here's his dietary patterns again, just to remind you. And so um, mom right away said, no way, he's eating two breakfasts, I'm taking care of that. So she's, she's, um, she, I didn't have to say anything. Upon hearing that, she said, I'm taking care of that, and you know, okay, roll with it, that's a change. Um, this became a little harder. Um, and we discussed acanthosis, we can discuss family history of diabetes, we talked about obesity. Um, she thought maybe she could stop buying soda, um, but her son would be unhappy. And sometimes you have to talk about unhappiness and anger management when you do this and help the parents figure out how to do this in their own family if, 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 uh, because the biggest question you can ask is what will happen if you really do take the sodas away? Because often it's, um, he will have a tantrum, he'll get angry, my husband will object, he'll bring in soda, the brother, the 14-year-old brother who's playing sports and as thin as a rail won't like it, and then you have to help the family deal with what to do then. So here's his physical activity, and um, all physical activity changes seemed hard to the mother and son. It seems like work to many people when you say get more active. And this is very interesting to me. Activity and play used to be, you know, activity used to be the play of childhood. The play of childhood now is not activity. What is it? Digital. It's digital. So the play of childhood is now digital. It's not activity. So what does activity seem like to most parents? Work. You're making me work. Um, so the best they could do is look into the local Boys and Girls Club. And then I asked them to keep track of screen time just as, and they agreed, just as a way to, to start the ball rolling. But it's, a, it's amazing to me that activity now is the work of childhood and digital time is the play of childhood. So you want a positive discussion of, with the family that's evidence-based about what can happen. And you want to use the family's strength to overcome a barrier. Use the family's strength to overcome the barrier. Mom, it's clear that you really care about your son. You brought him in. We're sitting here talking about the weight. You love him very much. This is a strength. This is really great. This is a strength. How can we use that care and concern to help you overcome some of these things that you're dealing with? Does, if you have a kid who's doing well in school, you do well in school. You do your homework every day. That's great. That takes a lot of discipline. You're really doing great. Would you like to keep some diet records? And just use the same kind of thinking. You're, you're great at doing homework. You're great at doing assignments. Would you like to do that? So use a strength that they have to overcome or help them with something they're struggling with. Allow for personal family choices. But the sicker the kid, you know, you're not going to let an impending type 2 diabetic, you're, you're going to really work hard to help them make some, some change, right, to, to set that foot on the pathway of change and set up specific achievable goals that are small enough to get. You get the perfectionistic families that say, well, I can do these 10 things, and what about the meals, and what about the, the, the gym, and what about this, and you can't do all that. One or two things, if you do them and you do them well, that's a great start. And then just be, be aware of cultural norms. My faux pas of the many I've made over the years was to, just in random conversation, talk to the mom and, and just happen to say, well, when you're sitting around the, 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 the kitchen table, and she goes, we have no table. What do you mean table? We eat on the couch, and we have trays, and we have no table. So you know, you really want to be careful about what you're assuming about the family. The other, thing, the other uh, more recent thing is I happened to be talking to a mom who had three sons who had uh, autism. And one of them was morbidly, they were all overweight, but one was morbidly obese. And I just happened to, to just say, I'm not, I just was in conversation. We were talking. And I said, well, I will, you know. Mom, I will never judge you. And she burst into tears. And she burst into tears because she said, every doctor along the way I have felt judged by. Now, whether she was being judged or not, she felt judged that she couldn't get a grip on this autistic kid's overweight. So it's important that we don't just assume that they know we're here for goodwill. Sometimes we have to make it explicit. I'm not going to judge you. 
I'm not going to judge you. I'm, gonna, I'm here to help. I'd be here. I'm not going anywhere. You can come back. I'm here. I'm here to help you. Um, modeling in the office. Um, we can do some things in the office to indicate our intent. Uh, books, posters, videos promoting health li healthy lifestyles was in one of our inner city practices. And they said, well, Sandy, this is great. All those handouts are beautiful. But you know, we were finding them in the trash can on the way out. Um, so that led to a discussion about, OK, can we do 5210 instead of talk about it? So the staff said, well, yeah, we can, instead of eating snacks behind the front desk, you know, we'll bring in fruit, started eating fruit. We could give them water instead of juice when they have to, they, they're thirsty or they want to take a pill or they have to do something. We could get the soda machine out of the staff break room. So sometimes it's not, sometimes modeling speaks louder than, than all the handouts in the world. And the, your office staff are powerful people. They're very powerful. The office staff often come right from your community and have a big impact on the parents and kids because they're talking to them possibly more than anybody else. Um, and that really is just uh, reminding you that this message can, can uh, cut many different ways, both in your offices, along the continuum of obesity, and in the communities. OK, so I will be glad to take questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, with sleep apnea kids, um, do you manage to get uh, positive sleep apnea for them? Yeah, we, um, when, they're, when they have sleep apnea, we actually use BiPAP a lot in our hospital, and we work with our pulmonary colleagues to do that. We have a sleep clinic. Um, will they wear it is another question. And so one time in my clinic, have any, who here has tried or just experienced, not maybe even for your own health, but just tried on a BiPAP or CPAP mask? Anybody done that? OK, I encourage you to do that. I brought BiPAP up to my staff meeting one time and had everybody put on a BiPAP mask. And let me tell you, the only person who was happy with it was one of my nurses who was a scuba diver, who had learned how to do that. It's not so easy. So sometimes it's not enough to prescribe the BiPAP. You have to work with the kid and desensitize them to the mask. When it works, it works. When it works, it works. So it's a very frustrating thing. Because when it works, the kids are more awake. They do better in school. They feel really better. The bedwetting often stops. But you have to do some work to get it to work. Yeah, it's hard. OK. Yeah. Oh, hi. I'm Alan Morris. I'm a pediatric oncologist in Portland. So you talk about families being judged. And there's some recent studies to show if we use the word obesity actually in the office, that they may have, that may have a negative um, effect on weight loss. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I never use the word. Obesity. I don't even call my clinic an obesity clinic. It's a weight management clinic. I don't use the weight word. In fact, one of the mothers said to me, I always ask the kid, why are you here? It should be obvious, right? But they don't always know why they're here in weight management clinic. And the mother, and I always say to the mother, what have you told the kid? They'll come in here, and the mother goes, well, we don't use the W word, the weight word. I don't use obesity. I use health, health risk, fitness. Good eating habits. I, they know I measure weight, but no, I, I agree with. I agree with that. I think that we don't labeling doesn't usually serve a, a purpose. For my purposes, when I bill, yeah, I bill that way. Um, I don't even like the word, and I used it a couple times in the talk. I don't like. Um, uh, I like children with obesity, not obese children. I try to say children with this illness, but I think we do have to be careful, careful, careful about the language we use. Yeah. Yeah, the, we did focus groups with the families of uh, under five-year-olds. And, and the, the word, they don't want to hear that word. They want to hear about their, their, the same thing any parent wants to hear about, the health of their children, the healthy behavior, health risk, um, sometimes family history. So I think you just need to, to um, honor what's happening and not carry any pejorative terms into the visit with them. Sometimes it's hard. I mean, sometimes a uh, weight condition or overweight yeah. kind of might even slip in to the yeah. conversation. And, uh, it's, sometimes it's hard to avoid the elephant in the room if you Yeah, and I would say one, one way of helping is to focus on high-risk behavior. So are you happy with how they're eating and what they're eating? Are you happy with how, what their physical activity is? And move sort of proximal to the BMI toward the health behavior. Because although they may not want, like discussing it, it's not as pejorative. Okay. 
Hi, Linda Ziegler from Penn Bay Healthcare. I was interested in your comment at the beginning of your talk about the importance of meeting the families early before the kid is born or the yeah. next kid yeah. is born. And I'm wondering, um, how do you collaborate with the maternal uh, health team, the OBGYN team, if in assessing a mother's risk uh, nutrient assessment and what the weight is? Uh, is I know that um, anybody that uh, is at risk for prediabetes automatically is referred to our du Diabetes and Nutrition Center, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of pregnant moms that come in that what they're eating is uh, not so good and they're overweight to begin with. And the evidence that I'm looking at at how what uh, parents eat affects yeah. risk for yeah. child uh, is getting pretty compelling. So our best chance as pediatricians is because there's not that many preconceptual visits is to get the mother like with the next child, right, to try that. We, we are working aggressively in Delaware at least to get every hospital breastfeeding friendly to start out that discussion early. Um, the, we haven't really made great strides into the OB's office, although they all are working on the maternal gestational weight gain guidelines. So um, I think it's a work in progress. I think as a pediatrician right on the ground right now, you, if you have young families, you try to get the mom you know, between kids and try to alter it. Then it's the, from the FITS data for toddlers, it's very clear. You know, what the, parent, what the kid will eat what the parents eat, eat hands down. That's, that's battle. You know, whatever's happening in the home, happens to the kid, but it's crucial. And yet, I, it's hard to know, like we have to break that cycle in multiple places because we know uh, women with obesity and diabetes, um, the children are more at risk, are born at higher risk for obesity and diabetes. So it's a, it's a malignant cycle. Um, yeah, all of that's important, yeah. yeah so sorry. I just want to comment on that. So what we're going to be doing with Let's Go, it's actually working in, with our um, family practice mm -hmm. colleagues and our OBGYN colleagues because they've reached out to us. So mm -hmm. there's a tremendous uh, energy around that for them to say, mm -hmm. we, they've said, what can we do, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. We're also in the state of Maine. Um, we're going to be working with any hospital that wants to be baby friendly as part of this grant from, from Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare mm -hmm. Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so just put that yep. there. And I think that, I'll just put in a plug, I think baby friendly is incredibly important and your providers have to be prepared with some advice and help for the breastfeeding mom once they come out of the hospital. And then I think we also have to be really prepared to look at infant satiety and hunger cues with babies who are formula fed for whatever reason and not disenfranchise the formula feeding moms but really focus on them as well. I'm trying to get our hospital to let our formula feeding moms of infants into our breastfeeding rooms because I don't really think, I think all mothers and children should have places to, to be, to, to honor that feeding dynamic, which is so important. And, you know, it's not always a woman's choice that she, she can't breast, you know, she doesn't breastfeed. It, it may be for other reasons. So anyway, just my plug. I think the infant mother feeding dyad is just incredibly important. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Hemal Mehta. I'm a pediatrician from San Mateo County. Yeah. And I have a, a couple questions. I'm not sure if they are within the scope of the lecture, but mm -hmm. sure. uh, one of the things was with regards to uh, obs obstructive sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. If every single child needs to move on to pulmonary and CPAP, or patients who have mild OSA can just be observed, I mean, what is the guidelines regarding this. That's the first question. The second is I have not found anything related to parameters of metabolic syndrome in children in terms of when is this child having this problem and who takes care of them afterwards. Okay. And I think those would be okay. two to start off. So for sleep apnea, if it's there, you need to treat it. So if you document it on nighttime polysomnography that you have it, you need to treat it. Now you can say, well, I'll treat it with weight loss because weight loss sometimes removes the symptoms. I'll treat it temporarily with a tonsil and adenoidectomy if you have enlarged tonsils and adenoids, you know. But um, if, if they're symptomatic, falling asleep in school, and you know, the severity of the symptoms goes up, it needs to be treated. So if you have it, it needs to be treated. The, the harder part for me is always who needs to be referred to get a sleep study because there's been no good predictive questionnaires or histories about who gets referred. And that's the, there's no good predictive way to tell. So we do both a daytime and a nighttime history. What's happening in the day? Are you tired? Are you napping? Are you inattentive in school? And a nighttime history, are you snoring? Are you apneic? Are you waking up frequently during the night? 
to, uh, how many pillow, do you have, you know, three pillow orthopnea to try to get us closer to who needs a sleep study. It's not as well thought out as who gets one. Um, but if it's there, you need to treat it some way. You need to have a treatment plan. Um, metabolic syndrome, I, I may defer this one to Reggie, but um, we don't often, we, we sort of diagnose the components of it. I don't think we're, we're uh, you can call it metabolic syndrome. There's a code for it. Um, it's basically an in insulin resistance package that you're dealing with. And uh, I don't know if you value to call it because you're uh, developing programs or services or you need to bill with it. There are criteria to do that. Or you can just deal with the components of it. And Reggie, I don't know. Do you want to talk more about that? Just very briefly, uh, metabolic syndrome used to be unheard of in pediatrics. Now it's a well-known constellation. Mm -hmm. And what we recommend is if you see the individual components, you need to recognize and treat the individual components. If you want a definition, the, the so-called experts, there were a series of articles in pediatrics about nine months ago, and the experts in metabolic syndrome could not agree on what the definition yeah. is. In other words, how high your triglycerides yeah. should be and so on. So what I would suggest to all the practitioners, if you have a fasting glucose that's elevated or a hemoglobin A1C, if your triglycerides are up, if you have all the other signs of metabolic syndrome, you need to treat all of them, yes. even if you don't call it something. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's well known they will track, they will continue into adulthood, and they will develop all the signs and symptoms of metabolic syndrome, including premature death. So yeah. even though we don't call it metabolic syndrome per se, all the components are there, and they're not going to go away right. untreated. Right. And you need to identify them and, and go after it. Hi, thank you. I'm Karen Vosey, and I had a Harvard Pilgrims Foundation. I'd like to go back to the case of the eight-year-old boy you were talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When that mom and child leave the clinic, mm -hmm. um, and she's motivated, where does she turn for uh, coaching, help, support? Could you talk a little bit about um, successful families and how mm -hmm. they've managed to do yeah. this? Because for a lot of the families that we all know, mm -hmm. um, single parents, you know, really struggling the thought of making these changes is really, really hard. So who's helping them do this once they get back home? So we kind of look at the rings of influence. So the first thing we try to do is bring in other extended family members. So whoever has influence in the family for good or bad. Good or bad, like Reggie said, sometimes you bring in the, the people who are sabotaging. But we try to do that first ring of influence first, the proximal ring. We have many, many calls to schools and have engaged school nurses. We have written prescriptions. You can write for certain food. I haven't tried writing for physical activity, but I know we can write for food if it's a daycare child. So we link then with the schools and the daycares. And we have an active program in Delaware of working with schools and daycares around obesity. And we have worked with them in terms of mostly um, daycares with food and activity, and we train daycare providers. Um, with the schools, to, to go back to the question that was asked previously, we, our best success has been in the after-school programs. We've had tough time working into the school day. Um, in fact, legislation for 150 minutes of physical activity in school day was just de defeated in Delaware by the teachers. So um, my, I chair our Governor's Council on Health Promotion Disease Prevention, in which I have the, the people from the Department of Ed and, and everybody else on, on this. And my strategy now is asking the school, tell us how the rest of the sectors can help you. What do you need from us? Because I think we have knocked on their door a long time and asked for change, change, change. And they keep telling us they vote with their feet. They, they, you know, they don't do it. Or they, and my thing is, OK, how can you tell us? What do you need from the health sector? Could the employers be helpful to you? you know, could the public health be helpful to you? Let's try it that way. But um, so. Then, so we extended family, school, we're working with the Y to have a, programs for obese children, children with obesity, because um, we know they, that I, for me to refer to a community exercise source, I have to be really sure they understand what's happening with that child, because um, I don't want to refer them to a place where it's going to be made worse. So we chose to work with the Y on a specific program we could refer to. So I think we just build it out in concentric rings until sometimes we have home health nurses go out when it's really severe. You know, so we build it out in rings. Sometimes all it takes is the extended family. Sometimes it takes them in the school. Sometimes it takes them in the school and the community. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're reaching far out, and we can't mobilize enough resources. So that's how we kind of build it out. So, any other questions? 
Thank you very much.